talking a little bit earlier about uh, your football career in Amarillo and then how your son Cameron has really gone on to be one of probably the number one prep school quarterback in the country and now going to Harvard. you got to be really proud of that. Yeah, well, I am, uh, but uh, partially responsible to his godfather, Fess, uh, that he's going to Harvard because he, he leaned on him hard and heavy as much as I did to make that decision. This is a big thrill for me. When I was three, four years old, one of the first pictures I ever took was me wearing a Davy Crockett hat, and I, I was such a Davy Crockett fan. I, with your size, you, you're 6'4", 6'5"? Uh, 6'6", six, six, actually. Wow. And you played football? I did, but not very well. <laughs> what school did you play at? Uh, San Angelo High School football. When I got out of the service, I, I was uh, uh, going to a little school called Hardin Simmons University, who sent a bunch of guys to the big leagues and uh i had an accident that summer and i couldn't do it after that yeah but you said well i actually things worked out pretty good for you though it did it did how did you and ron get to know each other well i I think he heard me talk and he said are you from texas and i said yeah i'm from texas (laughs) as it turns out we uh we might even in some distant way be related because uh my folks and his both from Comanche County, oh. and it's not very big, and it's pretty much inbred down there. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, we met. Uh, actually, we met on an airplane going to a tennis tournament uh, uh, about uh, thirty-seven years ago. We both played tennis then, and uh, uh, Fess played very well. As a matter of fact, very good tennis player. And Fess became uh, Cameron's godfather. Yeah, Mess and Marcy are uh, my children's godparents, and uh, they've they've been given very reasonable advice down through the years. That hence Harvard. Forward by Ron Ely. At Fess's 80th birthday party, a friend stood to give a toast in which he recited all the labels that applied to Fess. I borrow from Charles Bargill here, as he stated, "Fess is a father, husband, friend." Businessman, actor, athlete, entrepreneur, son, winemaker, hotelier, singer, neighbor, benefactor, patriot, veteran, Texan, and on and on, giving voice to a list that seemed never-ending. The audience that night was comprised of friends from the entire continuum of Fess's life. Charles Bargill himself is one of those friends collected by Fess from his Santa Barbara days. In fact, he was the lawyer from a small local Santa Barbara firm that Fess chose to lead his fight against the powerful 20th Century Fox legal team in his lawsuit against them. This fact was a source of great pride to Fess in that he and his small-town lawyer took the fight to the giant corporation. It was a fight that Fess and Chuck Bargill won. And just to set the record straight here, Charles Bargill may practice in Santa Barbara, but he can stand toe-to-toe with any big city legal force brought against him. On that festive night, we were all assembled in a huge tent erected for the occasion. It was impossible to be there and not feel some history around you. Human history with a hundred different stories defining a friendship with a man that somehow linked us all together. I knew most of those people myself, and from one end of the tent to the other, I could name them and recall their relationship with Fess. It was an eclectic collection of childhood friends, college buddies, Navy pals, colleagues from the film or business world, and neighbors from Santa Barbara, Santa Inez, and Los Angeles. I knew their stories with Fess, and they knew mine. Fess liked to share his friendships, and in so doing, he made them all stronger. That would be a good lesson for anyone to learn. You will meet many of Fess's friends here in the pages of William Chimerica's fine account of Fess's life. What a life it was, too, spanning more than eight decades from the Great Depression to the Great Prosperity. Fess began his life in a small Texas town in Comanche County. That was one of the many things we had in common, as my family background traces back to that same county. Although we never investigated the possibility, we both felt there might be some ancestral connection between us. Both the Parkers and my grandparents' family moved on to other towns, eventually settling many miles apart, but still within the boundaries of that great state. That was another thing we shared, a deep love and devotion to our home state of Texas.
We also shared the same values, dreams, and basic ambitions. As words like honor, courage, integrity, and courtesy seemed to lose their meaning in a society quickly losing its core, it was always nice to sit for a while with Fess and speak the same language. It would be almost impossible to summarize Fess in a few words, but perhaps it would suffice to say that he was a man of the West who was sentient to an earlier day. Les Brown Jr. and his orchestra played at that birthday party, as he had done for Fess and his wife Marcy at other events. I am thinking especially of the reception for their daughter, Ashley, upon her marriage to Rodney Shull. Their events were always memorable, and of course, there was much about that reception to put into a memory box. I remember dancing with my preteen daughter that night, with Robert Mitchum pretending to cut in, much to my daughter's delight. As examples go, that one does a fair job of depicting the tone of casual formality that graced all their parties. So it was with the 80th birthday party. Oddly enough, I do not remember if I gave a toast that night or not. My guess would be that I did. I do, however, remember some of the others, in addition to Charles Bargell, who got to their feet to speak or sing, or in some cases do both. What was most remarkable to me on that evening was the commingling of recent and lifelong friendships at every table in that tent. It might have been on that night that I realized what made Fess so different from every other person I had ever known. The one word that Charles Bargell used, tucked in among all the others in describing Fess, that leapt out at me that night was the word friend. There he was, on his 80th birthday, surrounded by people from all walks of life who considered themselves, each and every one, to be a friend of Fess Parker's. It was easy to see how that could happen. He was very approachable. His demeanor was friendly and unthreatening. He was also a fan of other people who achieved greatly. He was without guile or pretense. His manner was humble, and even with his size, he was unimposing. He spoke in a slow, measured rhythm that was pure Texas. He never tried to be anything else or speak in a manner that was not bred into him. Although he had developed some sophistication in the world of food and wine, his pleasures were simple ones. His successes were gained with grit and determination, and often in spite of the roadblocks others put before him. He did not flaunt his achievements in any visible way. He also did not harbor resentment for those who had opposed him, although he was very aware of their identities. He preferred low-mileage used cars to new cars, and his automobile of choice was a Mercedes, all of which we discussed over countless meals and cups of coffee over the years. Fess was a proud man. He had a right to be. He had a history of great success that was not limited to business or career. He and Marcy had a marriage that spanned more than five decades. He had two children, Eli and Ashley, who had become successful adults, themselves raising children that were all moving in the right direction. He had grandchildren, a great-grandchild and godchildren to whom he was always attentive and mindful. He had an array of accomplishments that were as diverse as his friendships. He could sing and play a guitar just as easily as he could saddle and ride a horse. He loved words and reading and was intent on learning everything he could about everything right up until his final days. He sought to engage people at their core, at that place that was most comfortable for them, and in that way learn about them. He could discuss historical events as easily as he could speak of current affairs. His mind was always alive and ready to hear an interesting story. Fess was not a big laugher. He was a smiler. I do not believe I ever heard a guffaw or a belly laugh out of Fess in all the years I knew him. He was more of a chuckler or chortler when he was greatly amused. That is not to say he did not have a sense of humor. He did. He loved to hear funny stories, and he loved to tell them as well. I believe that Fess made a conscious choice at some early stage in his life to keep a lid on all his reactive emotions. He did not express his anger outwardly. In fact, I am sure that most people who knew him would say that they never saw him angry. I have seen him go through some things that would have had others raging to the heavens, but that was not Fess's way. He managed tough situations with great calm and reasonableness, and as a result, usually achieved satisfactory solutions. I saw him on the last afternoon of his life. 
my three children, his godchildren and my wife, Valerie, and I sat with him and Marcy for two hours or more, simply talking and telling meaningless stories. His eyes were bright and alert, and there were glimpses of the same fests that would meet me for lunch and a beer at the Dutch Gardens or the Red Barn or the coffee shop at his hotel. It really did not matter where, but those were times when we would share some of our deeper thoughts with each other, knowing that they would never be spoken to another soul. As we left on that last afternoon, we all shook his hand, said we loved him, and kept our emotions intact until we could get to the car and out of view. The last to shake his hand was my son, Cameron, who shared a special bond with Fess. I watched from the door as Fess held Cameron's hand for a prolonged moment as if he were trying to convey something to him, to impart something that was beyond words. There is so much to be learned from Fess's life and the way he lived it. I am thankful to Bill Chimerica for compiling this history of my friend and brother. It is comforting to have these pages to remind me of so many of the tiny facets of what was such a huge presence in my life. I will miss Fess, do miss Fess, more than I ever imagined. There is no question his passing has left a void in my life, just as it has in the lives of his family and other close friends. These pages might help those who did not know him to understand the great loss to those of us who did. Ron Ely.